two is take that number, that two, divide it through that, change that, take divide all three by that, and then change those to zeros, and that's all one. That's the only thing I need to do. Okay. And then I can perform like a while loop. Close that. So we're gonna do this so today, we're gonna to finish the fundamental theorem of finite Boolean groups. One big substantial limit is the main kind of induction step left to do. Um, so just extremely quickly, let's look at the lemmas that we found. So remember, I'll just really sketch really fast up right here. The theorem is trying to tell us that every finite Abelian group, every finite Abelian group, then G is going to be isomorphic to a direct product. So this looks like a product, but um, direct product of these cyclic groups on parallel. Pj not necessarily distinct. Pj primes not necessarily distinct. So direct product of groups of prime parallel. Lemma 13.6 says that if n is the order of g, g is a, one of these finite abelian group. If n is the order of g and p divides n, then g has elements of order p, i.e. subgroups. So groups isomorphic to Zp, cyclic group of order P. Okay. Showed that, sorry, lemma 13.6 G. And the 13.7 says G a P group. That means for every X in G, there exists K such that the order of x is p to the k. p group is a group that consists of elements, all of whom have orders on power of p. If g is a p group, then the order of g is itself some, some power of p. Lemma 13.8. This is where we start to get into the direct products. It says G is isomorphic to G1 direct, well, it's actually an internal direct product of G1 up to GK, where that where you have the order of N, G, which is N, has this prime factorization of p to the i it's got a, i don't necessarily want to conflict with that notation up there p to the i beta i this is where we first start to get into the direct products m 13.8 said g is isomorphic to this direct product where what are these g i is the the p i primary component meaning it's the set of all G in the group G, such that the order of G is some power of the prime um, some power of the prime PI. So it gathers together all the elements of G which have order some power of the PI. So each of these GI, these are called the, the primary components, each of these GIs are a P group for the prime PI. They're not yet necessarily are cyclic groups of prime power order. Okay? They could themselves be non cyclic groups. So now we come to the missing step. The missing step is going to say it's going to take groups like the GIs and show that each of these can be written in that form, direct product, cyclic groups of prime power order. 
that if you know that each of these can be written as a product of those z's, then of course the whole thing can be. You just concatenate all the direct products for each g up. So lemma 13.9 is the is the new one. So we we drop some of the indexing. So so here we assume that G be a finite abelian P group. P group. Okay, so dropping the index I, we're just focusing on one prime P. So G, G is a finite abelian group, all of whose elements have order some power of this prime P. Okay. And B, we know the order of G is equal to P to the R sub R, okay, from lemma 13.71. The group has order P to the R. We let G, G is a, not necessarily a unique element, but a, one of the special elements, let, so let G be an element of this group, let it have maximal order. Particular, particular, particular. Yeah, so, so saying that if you say let it have maximum order, you kind of mean it has the order that is greater than all the others. Yeah, strictly greater. Than if you say it's it's of maximal order, means no element in G has order bigger than the. Yeah, there might be many others on the same level as. Oh, it could even be equal. Could even be yeah equal order. Yeah, only equal order. Yeah, yeah. Equal but there's nothing equal. in the group that has order larger than. Yeah. Capital. Or then a little g. So if I, you know, if you say you're of maximum intelligence in the class, you know, <laughs> means you're brighter than everyone else. But if you say you're of maximal intelligence, it implies well, there's no large intelligence to me, but maybe some of people stand. Yeah. It's sort of equal I <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I'm okay. probably the I'm probably the, the least. I'm probably the minimal order. IQ is Sorry. meaning IQ is meaningless. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Um, okay. <laughs> so let G have maximal order. So what is so obviously it's it's a finite group. Everything must have order less than P to the R. So there are some elements of maximal order. Yeah. Speed. And nothing can have order bigger than P to the R. Yeah. Remember the order greater of your element divides P to the R. That's what we so then this is the conclusion of the theorem. It says G is isomorphic to the cyclic subgroup generated by G, an internal direct product with H for some subgroup, some subgroup H of G. Now this is going to be one of our Z's, okay? Because remember, G is a P group. Every element has order some power of P. So this G will be isomorphic, it will be a cyclic group of order, some power of P. And B. That is a cyclic subgroup of order, some power of P. And let's call it M, because we're about to, we're about to call the order of little g. Z into the M. That's true for some M. So that will be one of our, one of our Zs. And of course, H, in that case, H will be a smaller subgroup of G. So once we know that this theorem is true, we'll be able to apply the theorem to this H. And say that H, you can peel off a cyclic subgroup direct product factor from H. And then it'll be cross a smaller subgroup still. But then apply the lemma to that smaller subgroup. So when you, by repeatedly applying, repeatedly applying this lemma, We'll be able to each time suck off and extract these cyclic groups, these factors in, in a direct product construction until, and this subgroup is getting smaller all the time. Yeah. So it has to eventually become the smallest possible subgroup, just the trivial subgroup. Yeah. And then it can be forgotten about because adding on a, a direct product factor of the cyclic subgroup, it may as well not be there. What they're doing is adding on a fixed single entry to every vector. We're not actually creating them. 
So that's what we're going to prove. Now, proof. How are you going to prove this? Well, you've got to approach it in some kind of systematic way. So we're going to be inducting on uh, the order of um, the order of the group. I'll try and keep with his notation wherever he is notation to clear. So, so let the order of G be P to the N. We'll use induction on N. And we will induct on N. So it's base case. Base case. A maybe could say zero, N equals zero, in which case G is the trivial group. The trivial group just is the trivial group. There's nothing much to say about it. Um, to the so we're going to start the induction on n equals 1. So there we're saying the order of G is P. It's a group of prime order. Therefore, every element in it, every non identity element in it, is ordered. But it's it's the sixth Remember, we've already proved that. There's only one group uh, of order p. Take any non-identity element in it. It will have order p. It's a count of order one. So it's not the identity. It will have order p. So it'll generate the whole group. So g is, is just going to be a sixth group. In which case, g is isomorphic to is the cyclic subgroup generated by G. So let G be an element of G, G not equal to the identity element. Okay, and there's nothing to prove, uh, but H will just be the trivial subgroup. We, we wouldn't bother writing that in as a direct product factor. It's like writing one squared by one product of numbers. You just leave it off. Okay, so that's the base case dealt with. Base case just is this to begin with. Yeah. So now we make the induction assumption. So we want to be clear on what we're saying. We're assuming that the theorem holds, the, the lemma holds, for every group of order some lower power of, of P. So assume the lemma holds for all such G, all such groups of order P to the K for one less than or equal to K strictly less than N. Those are cases of strong induction, where you're assuming to include the results for all previous cases. We might need to call upon any of them. And now we're going to try and prove it for P to the N. Okay, so we've already said G is order P to the N. Okay. So let G, element of G, be a maximal order element. And the order of G, we'll call it P to the N, say. What do we know about M? We know that M is less than or equal to N. Okay? The element little g can't have order bigger than N. Okay, so M is less than or equal to N. We know that. And because it has maximal order, so this is something we might need later on, and notice for every A in G, if you take A and raise it to the power P to the M, what are we going to have? So P, G, little g is maximal order. So nothing has order bigger than P to the M. But it's a P group, so everything has order some power 
every element in G will have order less than or equal to P2. But everything has order some power of P. So it's going to be a, either this power of P or a smaller power of P. So when you raise it to P to the power M, you're already raising A to its order, some lower power of P, and then raising it some more. So it's, it's going to be equal to the identity. Because you're, you're raising A, you know, to, to raise it to the power of P to the M is to raise it to some smaller power of P, raise it to the power of some smaller power of P, which will be its order, which will give you the identity, and then maybe raise it to further powers. But then it'll, st it'll still be stuck at the identity. So that's true since P to the M is the maximal order. So that's just true of every of every element. Now it could be the case, could be the case that um, the group G has order P to the N. Or could be sorry, so so I I M is equal to N. In which case i.e. g is just equal to a cyclic subgroup generated by this element, and we're done. There's, there's no non-trivial h to identify. Again, yeah, this is, it, it could be the case that g is just a cyclic subgroup generated by g, that it's already one of those n's, a cyclic group of prime power order. In which case, nothing more to prove. We could just take, just take, if you really want your H, just take it to be the trivial subgroup. Okay. But we normally wouldn't write that in the direct product. So in that case, there's nothing to prove. So then that gives us, I mean, we, we, we stressed this thing before. If there's nothing to prove in that case, that means we should assume that that is not the case. If it is the case, the thing is true, we can see that. So we must assume now that it's not the case and then provide the argument that proves the lemma or you know, succeed, uh, achieves the induction step in that case. So additionally, assume that M is now strictly less than N. So that means there are elements in the group G that are not in the cyclic subgroup generated by G. Cyclic subgroup generated by G will have order P to the M. That's the order of the G, the order of its generated. But G has a has a G has order a size uh, P to the N. to the n, so it's bigger than that, okay? So when n is less than n, so the cyclic subgroup generated by G is not all of the group G. So in that case, we, we identify another element. Let H be an element of G that is not an element of this cyclic subgroup generated. But not just any one of these elements that are not in cyclic subgroup generated by G. This time we let it have minimal order. Minimal order amongst such elements. Order. Amongst such elements, such elements that are not in simple subgroup so generated by G. Now, H can't be the identity element, because the identity element is in there. So, okay. so H can't have order one. So the order of H is some power of P bigger than or equal to, to one. 
Remember, everything in the group G, everything all over the place has ordered some pair. Of Um, so P is minimal order. We let H equal the cyclic subgroup generated by this H. What did, what did we see? And NB, the order of H is equal to, so it's equal to, Well, let's just say it's greater than or equal to p to the one. It can't be p to the zero, but one is not the identity. It's not in subgroup. So capital H is the cyclic subgroup generated by H. You'd be tempted to think that the capital H is the one that's identified in the lemma. Not quite. It's a little bit unfortunate choice of notation you did in the group, but it's going to be maybe some slightly larger subgroup than that. It's going to be the, the other part, the other factor of the direct product um, but the argument now we're, we're, we're going to focus on this H and um, see some properties of that. First of all, we claim that the intersection between G and H is trivial, it's as small as it can be. It can't be empty, of course, but they're both subgroups, so they must both contain the identity of it. But we claim that that is all they contain. And there's a little bit, not a gap as such, but a, a few, there's a little bit of a mini claim that's given without justification in the notes here. For this, to, to establish this claim, it suffices to show, so it's enough to show that the order of H, which is equal to the order of its generator, that this is equal to P, but it is really as small as it can be. We, we've noted already it has to be bigger than or equal to P to the 1. But actually, we'll be able to show that its order, the order of little h, the, order of the cyclic subgroup generated by little h, is, is, is exactly P. And that will be enough to show that they must have empty intersection. Now, we need a little explanation for why it suffices to show that. Because if, if H has order P, then every non-identity element of H As order P also, yeah? Every non-identity element of H has order P also. So if there exists HR, which is an element of the intersection of G with H, Then H, which equals the cyclic subgroup generated by H to the power of R, and that's true because every non-identity element of H has order P also. Remember, H is capital H is the cyclic subgroup of generated by little H. I'm assuming it's here as has order P. Where every other non-identity element is is a good generator for H. But if this HR is also in G. It means that this is a subset of G, the subgroup of G, the cyclic subgroup generated by it. But that would imply that little h was an element of cyclic subgroup generated by G. That's a contradiction. He claimed that H was an element in the generator. Yeah. Say that again. You said that H, little H at the bottom. Yeah. Well, there, but you're probably saying H yeah. is not an element. Of not G. an element of G. So here I've arrived that that it is an element of G. That's all. So 
So what? So that's a contradiction. That's definitely contradicting something we said. Yeah. So that contradicts the statement about little h plot. So what led to that contradiction? What led to that contradiction was this if here. If there exists some non-identity element, HR, in the intersection. You know the intersection does come with the identity because they're both subgroups. But if there was something non-trivial in the intersection, and this non-trivial element would also generate H, as H is generated by all its non-identity elements, if it has order P. So then it would be contained in G, as HR was, and the subgroup generated by HR is going to be contained in any group that contains HR, groups of the subgroups opposed. So that would imply that H is in G, which it can't. So it's this if that can't happen. So therefore, the intersection between these two will be the trivial subgroup. Now, we haven't yet proved that. All of this argument here just proves this, that, that it suffices to show that the order of H is P. And this explanation shows that if the order of H is P, then I will get my claim. So now, I try and prove H, H, the order of H is P. Okay? Because I want to establish this claim. But this is just an ex this is just all an explanation of why it suffices to show that the order of H is P. So now we claim, so now the claim is that the order of H is P. So we must show this. Consider so what do we know about H? We, we know the order of H is some power of P bigger than or equal to P to the power inside the P group G, the overall container. H is generated by little H, Yeah, capital H is defined to be the group generated by little H, where have I written that? Yeah, yeah. H is <laughs> so now the claim is, so, yeah, so we consider little h to the p, the power of p. What order does that have? Well, the order of h is some power of p. Here we've already raised h to the power of p. The order that that has is equal to the order that H has divided by P. Remember the definition of order. Order is the number, is the number, the, in, the exponent that you have to raise an element to to make it equal to the identity of. Yeah. yeah. So there's some order. <laughs> there, there is some order to H. It's some power of P. But now, if you think of the element H to the P, what order do you have to raise H to the P to? Yeah. What order, what exponent do you have to raise that element to to make it equal to the identity? You see, you've already got a factor of p there, and the order of h is some power of p. So, whatever order h has, I need to have that as an exponent on little h to make it equal to the identity. But you've already got a factor of p there, so you only have to raise it, the order of h divided by p. Because when you raise it to this order, these cancel. And you have h to the power of order of h, and so that's the identity. And that's the smallest exponent from which you get the identity. Okay? So in particular, the point is that that is smaller than the order of h. What does that tell us? h came with properties attached. Little h came to us with properties attached. Oh, helpfully there at the top of the page. Yeah, so if, if you divide a number by p, you get a strictly smaller number. H 
H had minimal order amongst such elements. What kind of elements? The, the ones that are not in the sequence of people generated by G. Yeah. So if we're now looking at an element, namely H to the P, which has smaller order than H, that means it can't be one of these such elements. Yeah? Because H came to us with, little H came to us with the property that it has minimal Minimal order. Yeah? I said it. Minimal order amongst all the elements that are not in the sequence of G generated by G. So here's an element which has smaller order than H, therefore it must be in the sequence of G generated by G. Yeah? You know, if somebody is, you know, somebody is the shortest height student in the class, right? Yeah. So if you see a student who's smaller than them, just, you know they're not in the class, yeah? Because you've already identified them as, as the student with minimal height. So if you see something smaller, it means they can't be. So that's the case here. So that implies H to the P is not in, is not one of these such elements. So it must be in the click subgroup generated. Read. So that implies H to the P is some power of G. E to the R sub R. Yeah. Now, if you take this G to the R and you raise it to the power P to the M minus 1, what do we get? Well, G to the R is H to the P. This is kind of what I was talking about a minute ago. When you raise it to the power P to the power M minus 1, you've got H to the P to the M. Oh, yeah. What did we say at the top of the thing? Little g had maximal order. Yep. We said it had order p to the n. So we, we noted there for future reference. Every element in the group, when you raise it to the power of p to the n, must be the identity. The largest possible, the maximal order. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I said for every, didn't I say for every a and g? Uh, you said that every A and G, A to the P to the N, is, is the yeah. identity. So here's a, uh, an instance of that. Yeah. Little H. Because okay. that was any A in the group at all. Yeah. Yeah. So what does that tell us? That tells us G to the R to this power is equal to the identity. So that implies that the order of G to the R divides P to the M minus 1. How did I that? I've got written down here, so, so the cyclic subgroup generated by G is not the same as the cyclic subgroup generated by G to the R. This will be a strictly smaller cyclic subgroup. I can't quite see what I've made use of that, but well, that's true anyway. Yeah. Also, this implies what we have up here. So if you expand this out on the expand this out here, what you've got there is g to the r to the p to the m minus one equals the identity. Sorry, I'm blocking the no, no, it's okay. G, so uh, just just apply that, so that multiplies that exponent. Um, but you see, we already, we've already declared upstairs that G has ordered P to the M. So that implies that P to the M divides R, P to the M minus 1. 
IEP divides R. So let's say R is PS. So that's divided. Remember, we're still buried in this subplane. We're still trying to prove that the order of H is P. <laughs> <laughs> so what are we going to so is everybody okay that R has to be divisible by P uh, yeah because we've seen here that G to this power is the identity but G to any old power is the identity the order of G must divide that power property of order the smallest number then when you raise it to that power goes the identity but also it divides every other exponent that gives you the identity, you raise it to that big point. So p to the n must divide this. Well, obviously, p to the n, the p to the n minus 1, you can cancel off that factor. So then you're left with p divided r. So r must be some multiple of p. And now we consider the element, we consider this a, which we construct as g to the power of minus s times h. Where is this? This is not in cyclic subgroup generated by G. Why is it not in the cyclic subgroup generated by G? This is an element of H. No. So do a little mini proof by contradiction of this. Suppose it was in there. If it was in there, so it's floating around as an element in here, you can just hit it on the multiplied by g a lot of times. g is also in here. And you would cancel off those g's to the minus s's, multiply it by g to the x. So then you'd end up, and remember, this is a close, it's a subgroup, so it's closed on the multiplication. So then you'd be end up saying that h was in here. But h was chosen at the beginning to not, remember, had minimal order under every over every element not in here. So h was not in here. Yeah. So a quick mini proof by contradiction says that if this product was sitting in here, then by closure, you could multiply it by any power of g, and you'd still have an element in here, cancel off the g to the minus s's, and be left with saying h is. So that's true, just very briefly, is h is not an element. But what is its power? See, this, what is its order? This element actually has order p you can see. So let's raise a to the power of p. That's g to the minus s times h to the power of p. Which is g to the minus s p h to the p. And it's an abelian group, so you can shift things everywhere. So this product raised to the power of p is just the p power of each of the products multiplied together. Um, so that's g to the minus sp, which is g to the, sp is r, so that's g to the minus r times h to the p. Well, what's g to the r? g to the minus r. g to the, g to the r was p. So g to the minus r is, sorry, g to the r is h to the p. g to the minus r is h to the minus p. And what's h to the minus p times h to the p? Identity. Okay. So that's A to the P is the identity element. It means it has order, well, the only thing you worry about is, is A the identity element? No, it can't be because it's not in the subgroup. So A can't be the identity element. I'm sorry, A, A, A can't be the identity element. But here it is, raised to the power of p, and you get the identity of it. So that tells you a is order p. It's not the identity element, so it doesn't have order 1. In this statement, a to the p equals e tells us that the order of a divides p. So it's either, so close. It's either 1 or p. It's either, it's either 1 or p. Okay. 
okay, well, what was this A? Remember, A is... Jesus, Jesus, S A H. A is not in... The generator. It's not in the cyclic group generated by G. What was that? H had the special property that it had the smallest order amongst all elements not in G. Yeah. But we're inside G, capital G. Every, G yeah. Everything is order some power. So here's an element floating around outside here, which has order P. But the H we gave ourselves had minimal such order over everything floating around outside G. So that tells us that the order of H is P. The smallest possible order. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get that. Which could then be implied that capital H in, has all in the P. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I.e. capital H, which is equal to circuit subgroup generated by that, that yeah. has already P. Yeah. Right. But remember, we said right off the top of the page, it suffices to show that this is true in order to conclude. So we can now say that the cyclic subgroup generated by G and H have only trivial intersection. That was our original claim. As claim. Now the reason we're doing that is remember, having trivial intersection is important when you want to set up internal direct products. It's one of the conditions. We still often we still often use our induction hypothesis. Yeah? So that's something that's floating around that we haven't used yet. So I don't know, see I can't squeeze it in in a minute. So we'll have to continue this tomorrow. Because say with the last subject tomorrow. Because there's about another page. Are you are you here tomorrow? Yeah. Yeah. Well, if this doesn't kill me, whatever I've got. Yeah, yeah. No, because there's there's just another page to go. Yeah, absolutely. So Tomorrow, we will further examine H. We're going to further examine H to find the necessary. It's going to actually be a subgroup of G which has H inside it. So we might have to potentially expand H a little bit, find the necessary factor for the product that shows that G is isomorphic to cyclic subgroup generated by G times something. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's going to be this, it might be H itself, but we might have to grow, grow H out of it. And we'll further examine H we'll by examining, and this is where we, this is going to get us into the factor group. See, we know now we proved H is order P, so that's enough for us to study the factor group. Remember, the factor group is size smaller than G. But that will be covered by the inductive induction hypothesis, which is covered. Well, exactly. Yeah, so, so the order of B mod H is the order of G divided by P. So it's particular it's smaller than the other G. G. So yeah. It will be covered by the induction assumption. And that's where we'll be able to get to, to make use of it. If you're, if you're in a proof by induction, you have to use the induction process, the induction assumption. So we prove the lemma is true, that the group factorizes like this for every group of size smaller than G. Just some power of P smaller than the N of every group. But passing to the factor group, that's that's going to be the one. But the factor group is not G, it's the factor group of G. So there's a little bit of the delicate arguments about matching what's going on in G with what's going on in the factor group of G. Okay. So the achievement there is to start the induction proof, 
and to show that the little g is the element of maximal order. And when you look at all the elements outside of the cyclic subgroup generated by g, you can find elements which have the smallest possible order p. That's what we want to do. The little g is an element of maximal order. It generates this part of capital G. And if it isn't all of capital G, and when you look outside of it, look amongst the elements outside of it, do find elements which have the smallest possible order. And then from there we're gonna from there we're gonna continue. Good. Okay.